I'm excited to be here today. Um, a couple weeks ago, my family was visiting. Um, my older two kids were in the spring musical at the middle school. And so my family came to visit, and my mom and my sister and I were having a conversation about um, traits that we inherited, um, ones that we like and ones that we don't. And uh, I was telling her a story about when I was in college, and I'd come out of my bedroom because I needed to talk to my dad about something. And so I came out, and in the kitchen where I kind of expected to find him, I found like a light fixture on the bar, and it was taken apart, and there was, you know, screws and stuff everywhere. And so um, I was like, well, he must be trying to fix this. So I went out to his truck where he keeps his tools, figuring I'd find him there. And the back of his truck was open, the tools are strewn about, and he's not there. And so I thought, well, he must not have found what he was looking for. So he went out to his shed. So I got to his shed, and that's where I found him, only he was playing mahjong on an old computer <laughs> instead of getting his tools. And what I was, my mom was like, how did you find him? And I told her, well, the ADD in me recognized the ADD in him, and I was able to track him down and find him. Um, that's definitely something I inherited from my dad. Um, my, our biological daughter is a good mix of Andrew and I both. Um, she's got his analytical and scientific brain, but then she, she shows her creativity that I think she got from me. And so it's neat to see that. But we all have some kind of resemblance to, to our families. And um, maybe it's personality or habits or physical characteristics. Um, but we all have some kind of inheritance um, that we show. And the tr same is true for, um, for just who we are and who we were created by. Um, I began to understand this a few years ago. We were living in Oklahoma and we were working on um, our church's leadership council. And the church was in this um, transition kind of phase. And so there was a lot of tension and we were uh, working together and there was this one member on the council that I kind of had an issue with. And so one day I was praying and I remember complaining to God about her because um, why not? And I think um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the last thing that had come out of my mouth was, God, you know how she is, <laughs> in which I had this like drop in my spirit. And I had just read this book, and in the book, every time God heard somebody's name, he would smile like, you know, a proud mother, like, I just love that child, you know. And so as I'm complaining and I'm saying, you know how she is, I feel like God just kind of spoke to me and said, I'm especially fond of that one. And so it was that beginning that I began to see that God had created her the way he wanted her to be. And I began to see her differently. And so this question kept coming to mind, and it comes to mind often. And this is falling off. <laughs> um, what if what really bugs you about a person is maybe the way that they reflect the character of God? Because we're all made in God's image. Each one of us bears traits of our creator. And I'm not talking about those things that maybe we inherit from society, from um, just bad habits or, or racism or those kinds of things that are contrary to God. But instead, like, what if the way that God made somebody is, is what bugs us? Um, like, what if that person's bossiness that gets on our nerves? What if that's leadership from God? What if um, that person that we feel like is just too overly sensitive, what if they're reflecting the compassion of God? And so we all have things that bother us about other people. Often it's the things that, um, that are different from ourselves. We get frustrated with people who think differently or believe differently or live differently. Um, and we kind of think of ourselves as being right or normal. <laughs> and, but we need to know that God uses our differences to show us the aspects of him and other people because none of us has all the aspects that God has. I mean, we couldn't have all those characteristics because he's so multifaceted. So what if what bugs you about a person is actually a characteristic that is reflecting their creator? 
So I want to look at what the Bible says about this and how we can be used in our uniqueness for God's glory. And it starts even in the very first chapter of the Bible. God's creating the world and people and everything in it. And he says, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. Now, let me stop there because I grew up in a fairly legalistic church environment. And so a lot of times when I heard this passage preached, it ended there. And it was just God created man in his own image. And some of that was used to um, justify like a hierarchy of men or women in ministry or marriage or one of those things. But um, when I was had just been serving for a small amount of time in church, um, I got to go see Nancy Beach speak. And she actually spoke on this passage. And she really pointed out the second part of that that passage and it says in the image of God he created them male and female he created them and so it was the first time that somebody had told me like hey you're a girl and God created you in his image because I I never heard that I never heard that I was an image bearer then theology that Latin term is imago Dei or the image of God because we all are and learning this brought so much freedom to me I grew up wanting to minister from a very early age and then I always wondered like is something wrong with me because I'm a girl <laughs> and so hearing this really set me free and I have realized he creates each of us so uniquely to bear his image and make a difference in the world and this is a very special aspect of being human because even though God created the world and everything within it, like he didn't make this with trees. There's not this special communion, this close relationship that he made with the animals or with the trees. But with humans, he gave us his image to bear to one another. Um, so how do we love others and bear this image? In Matthew 22, um, when asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says that the entire law could be summed up in these commandments. The things that are important, love God, love people. You know, what people? The ones we like, the ones that are easy to love. But when we continue to read the New Testament, we see examples given of the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the oppressed. And that's pointed out in Matthew 25. He says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in or, or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And then King will reply, Truly, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And it's not that these people have less value. Um, Oftentimes they have less to offer in return, but and they may be seen as the least in society, but, but be assured this is where the Holy Spirit is at work, and it's not easy, it's messy, it's tiring, and sometimes it's really, really hard, but when we realize we are image bearers and we get, begin to see the image of God in others, we also grow closer to God. In fact, I grew up hearing the verse from Matthew twenty eight nineteen. And it says, go into all the world and make disciples. And I heard this verse, and it was like, okay, so I barely left the South. And so I thought, well, when am I going to go and do something? Because I usually heard it in connection with missionaries when we were praying for them, or when a group was going, like, to Africa to build a well or something. And not that those things aren't important, because they are. But um, I think I was a junior in high school, and my... Uh, youth minister was preaching on this and he was saying that as he was studying the commentary it wasn't like a go somewhere else and do it it was as you're going throughout your life because God put you right where you need to be he's put the people in your life that you're to minister the people that we're supposed to love and to encourage and teach and and disciple they're usually right in front of us already so Sometimes we get really passionate about a group of people. Oops, sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> uh, 
whether it's like social justice or equality or those kinds of things, people in prisons. One that I've been missing um, since the pandemic started is the nursing home ministry. Um, but we can sometimes, like, we find our niche and we find where we just feel God and we see the Holy Spirit moving. And then we start to think, well, everybody else should feel this too. <laughs> and everybody else should want to serve here too. Um, but we get in trouble when we become somebody else's Holy Spirit and tell them where they should be or how they should be serving. In fact, my mom and I, we are very, very close. We probably talk almost every day. Um, and she's, she's mentored me for years and years, and I'm, I'm very thankful for her. And in the major things in life, we, we see eye to eye on. We love God. We love people. We love serving. We're a little strong-willed at times, um, but we also have some differences. There's the little political, social issues that we don't always see eye to eye on. And so a lot of times we would, we would have these conversations and we'd, you know, try to convince each other of our side. And we would usually end up, we're going to agree to disagree because we love each other more than we want to be right. But... Um, one day, one of these subjects came up, and I, I knew what she was thinking, and I just kind of braced myself because I was waiting for her to be like, well, you know, <laughs> but she didn't, and she said that she had been praying about it, and um, that she was asking God, like, how do I get her to see it my way, <laughs> and she said that God revealed to her, he made us so differently. My mom, in the spiritual gifts inventory, has the gift of prophecy, um, which is, doesn't mean she just like starts telling the future or anything. But she she's very black and white on a lot of things, and, and she's um, very passionate about teaching. And um, <laughs> she said that what God revealed to her is like I, I score very low in prophecy. It's probably my lowest one. My highest one is mercy, <laughs> and so we're very different. And she said it just hit her that God had made us different for a reason, and he, we saw things differently. And it wasn't that one of us was right and one of us was wrong, but maybe God was using us to speak to different people. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that we were supposed to see it the same way. And I found that. My mom um, has credibility with people I probably never will, and there are people God's put in my life that I've been able to speak into that maybe she wouldn't be able to. And I'm thankful for that. But there are times where we feel like we want somebody else's gifts too <laughs> because there are ways that she can speak into a situation. And I find myself going, gosh, I wish I could do that. But Isaiah 45.9 kind of warns us against this. The Lord said, you have no right to argue with your creator. You are merely a clay pot shaped by a potter. The clay doesn't ask, why did you make me this way? Where are the handles? <laughs> Because sometimes we get caught up wanting what other people have. We want other people's situations. But where you are right now and who you are, that's who God created you to be. Those things that, that you are reflecting of the creator are important because that's what he's put in you. Um, <clears throat> and then sometimes we want to be further along than we are. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell an embarrassing story. So... Um, <laughs> Back when Andrew and I were first married, um, I decided I was going to start doing Pilates. And so um, I remember the first time I did it, I thought I was going to die because my body didn't move like the women on the videos because it was this big balance ball and you would do these weird things with it like a seal. And I just thought, my body doesn't move like hers. But I kept trying and then the day after, I felt like I was really going to die because um, everything hurt. And then eventually, over time, I got better and more coordinated. And then I got a little cocky because I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm really good at this. Because I was probably, at the time, in the best shape I'd been. And I thought, um, I was watching the credits one day, and they were, like, promoing some like more advanced videos and I thought I can do that like who needs to buy the video so there was this move where she would put her like shins like on the balance ball and then she would put her hands on the floor and she would do push-ups and I thought that seems easy like you're just pushing yourself up and down right and balancing um 
But so I, I get in the position and I go down and I'm thinking, I got this. And I push myself up and I did not got this. I flipped off the ball. And unfortunately, in our living room, there was this like two foot by two foot like brick square where you would put your fireplace tools on. And so I flip over and landed on it right on my backside. So I had a bruise about this big for a week. And you would think, I bruised this side, like it hurts in that area. No, it radiated through my whole body <laughs> for a week. Like it hurt to sit. It hurt to lay down. And in fact, I think I laid on that floor for quite a while, again convinced I was going to die. Thankfully, Andrew wasn't home. And <laughs> I... Um, but eventually I got up, and but I was really sore. And so when I was thinking about that last night, the passage from 1 Corinthians came to mind. And because we are all made differently, we're all different parts of the same body. And it says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And that the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so comprised the body, giving greater honor to the part to the part that lacked it, that there be, may be no division in the body, but that the members have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This passage just speaks to the interconnectedness of the body. Um, God has given each one of us, and it's another reason we sometimes have to listen to the voices that are different than us. Um, those who come from different backgrounds, different life situations, we can learn so much just by getting to know other people. And like verse 26 says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We've had so many opportunities, I think, in the last year to hear the voices of other people, other people who are hurting and going through hard times. But God puts the hurting and oppressed people in our lives constantly and it's so important for us to love them tony evans um wrote a quote about being image bearers and he said that it means that we are to love other people because they bear god's image so it honors god and he goes a step further and says therefore any form of racism elitism discrimination or oppression is not only a social issue it is a sin <sighs> Another way that I think of it is that if we were created in God's image, when you insult people or call people names or make fun of someone, there's a chance you're insulting God. Like, that may be a characteristic of God in them. And I will say, I've, I've seen this. Um, I was never really sure of the privilege in my own life until we foster and adopted and then raising a child with special needs, I've realized that, that there's just stigma, there's, there's prejudice, and there's discrimination. Um, Susie has some really serious issues, and um, it's been really difficult for us to navigate. But at the same time, I can't imagine how difficult it is for her to navigate. And as I often say, my child's not her illness or her disability. She is also an image bearer of God. I see in her bravery and determination and perseverance. And she can touch people that I can't touch. And she sees things that other people don't always see. And she reflects the image of God 
And if I miss out on that, then I miss out on an opportunity to see God at work in her or to grow closer to God. C.S. Lewis wrote in Weight of Glory, There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is ours as the life of a gnat. But it is more immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outside, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. There is no one on this earth, there's no one in your life, a Christian, non-Christian, political party, whatever, that does not bear the image of God. And it doesn't matter what their nationality is or their race, like all of us bear God's image. And like the disagreement with my mom, uh, um, the Bible had disagreements too among ministers. Barnabas and um, Paul did not agree on who John Mark should travel with and if he should go be a missionary with them. So Barnabas and John Mark went to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas went to Syria, and God ended up using two different people in two different regions. But I'm not saying this is easy, I promise you. I struggle with this every day, Um, and I think that's why God keeps putting this message on my heart. It's uncomfortable, but when we begin to feel the friction that we feel with other people, it's an opportunity for us to ask God to show us how to love somebody, to show us how to find some common ground with them. We can pray and we can ask God to give us a heart to see people the way he does. We can ask God to show us the ways that that person is reflecting their creator. And we can ask God to show us that common ground that we share because I think a lot of times we have more in common with people than we realize. So imagine if we began to see other people this way. What if we began to see all people as having intrinsic value? How could we minister to those we do life with, those at our work, our family members? How would we see our communities change? Because where you are right now, that's your ministry. Your family is your ministry. Your work is your ministry. God has you right where he wants you. So as I close, um, Maybe there's somebody that came to mind as I was speaking that you're thinking, yeah, I feel tension with that person. (laughs) So I just want to encourage you to ask God to show you how to love that person, to show you what the common ground you have with that person, or maybe how you can minister and love on that person. Or maybe you were never told like I was, (laughs) or maybe you've forgotten that you bear God's image. You were created precious and he loves you so very much he's so fond of you he made you uniquely and he will use you right where you are and there are parts of you that reflect your maker so I'm gonna pray (laughs) father God I thank you so much that you love us that you want to have a relationship with us that father God that you just you're more gracious to us than we deserve And so, Father God, I pray that you help us to see others the way that you do. I pray that you help us just to speak up for the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan. And I pray that you will show us how to just encourage and to um, live in unity and and just be loved. But help us also also to accept your love, to remember that we are image bearers, that you desire to have a deep and and meaningful connection with us, and help us just to lean on you. In Jesus' name, amen.